through the Lord Jesus Christ, we come unto thee, our Father and our God, and in the Holy Spirit. We pray thee that thou shalt bless us as we read thy word, and that the Holy Spirit, the author, may be the true interpreter to our hearts. We ask it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This little letter of Paul to the Galatians is one of the most important documents in human history. It has been called the Magna Carta of spiritual liberty. The practical effects of this epistle reach into millions of homes. In fact, the epistle to the Galatians has a greater effect on how we live in the United States today than does the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution of our Republic. When you cross the border into Canada, you discover that our northern neighbors have as many liberties as we do, without any Declaration of Independence and without our Constitution and its Bill of Rights. This fact shows that our liberties do not come from these documents, but that these documents are merely the expression of liberties that existed before the time of the Founding Fathers, who set them down in concrete form in order that men might enjoy these God-given freedoms. But the letter to the Galatians comes right down to our century and into our homes. If you ate ham or bacon today, it is because of the truths set forth in the epistle to the Galatians. Before the time of Christ, God's people could not eat pork. We can. Why? Because of the truths in the epistle to the Galatians. If you are wearing a garment made of mixed materials, it is because of the liberties set forth in this epistle. In Old Testament times, a person could not wear any garment of diverse materials. All clothing had to be of one material, wool or linen, for example, but not wool and linen. Today, our clothes are made of coal tar, pine tree roots, sour milk, and who knows what. We have nylon, orlon, dacron, silk and wool, cotton and wool, or any other mixture that the scientist can produce. In our kitchen, we can cook food in any pot or pan that comes to hand. Our Jewish neighbors have one set of pans for meat and another set for anything that is cooked in milk. All of this stems from a verse in the Old Testament which says in Exodus 23, 19, you shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. What freed the Christian world from the bondage of kosher cooking? The answer is found in the truths set forth in the letter to the Galatians. Let us look for a moment at the background of this epistle. Galatia was a region in the central plateau of Asia Minor. When I first visited Turkey, I went to Angora, the capital. On a nearby hill, three or four miles from the edge of the city, lie the ruins of marble temples and the marketplace of the ancient town. This was one of the Galatian settlements. I sat on a fallen pillar read this epistle to the Galatians and thought about the people who lived there and events which took place. I looked out over the wide plain below and thought of Paul's travels and ministry to this ancient people. The name Galatia comes from the Gauls who migrated to Asia Minor from France long before the time of Christ. Their language had a kinship with Welsh and that of the Celts of Brittany in France. Their character was somewhat like that of their modern cousins, quick, volatile, eager, changeable. Caesar described the Gauls of Asia Minor as eager and bold in a new thing, but lacking perseverance. Their soldiers were brave in a first assault, but could not carry through to final victory. They were always ready to learn, but were incapable of prolonged application. In other words, they were much like multitudes of people in our day and civilization. Paul arrived among these people in the course of his missionary journeys and soon led a number of them to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And then a strange thing happened. Shortly after Paul's visit, a group of Jewish Christians arrived from Jerusalem, denounced Paul's doctrines, and challenged his authority, and plunged the young church into confusion. The news reached Paul, and the Holy Spirit within him moved him to righteous wrath. 
His epistle, which we now begin to read and study, is an explosion that combines rebuke and warning with profound teaching and leads us to assurance of the absolute certainty of our eternal position in Christ through sovereign grace. Let us begin to read the epistle. Paul, an apostle, not from men, neither through man, but through Jesus Christ, and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The apostle's righteous wrath does not permit him to write a lengthy introduction. There are no words of intimate love or Christian affection for his hearers. Truth is at stake, and his apostleship has been questioned. So at the start, he puts forth the authority of his writing. He is an apostle. He has not received his gifts from men, nor has he been sent by men. Over against man, he puts God, God the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father. Here is the source of his authority. Between the lines, we find the Holy Spirit also. For when Paul mentions the fact that the Father raised the Son from the dead, he is also implying the ascension. The risen, ascended Christ showered forth the Holy Spirit and all the gifts that came with him. It should be noted also that the epistle is not written from the church, but to the churches. This is the beginning of all Paul's writings. He would never agree to the idea that the church has any right to teach. In the Bible, the church does not teach. The church is taught. The Holy Spirit, the one and only vicar of Jesus Christ, is the teacher. While Christ was on earth, he was the teacher. And when he ascended, he sent the Holy Spirit in his place. Paul then bestows upon them the prayer of blessing from the Father and the Son, reminding them that the Lord Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from the American way of life. This may startle some people, but this is the heart meaning of what God calls this present evil age. Or if you're an African in the heart of Africa, Christ died to deliver you from the African way of life. The life of this world exists for man's self-gratification, pleasure, pride, and personal profit. The primary problem is man's disobedience to God. It took the death of the Lord Jesus Christ to bring man back from his evil way to the way of submission to the will of God and our Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. We would all be astonished if a congregation of Christians became followers of Mohammed while their pastor was on a vacation trip to Palestine. Yet that is about what happened in Galatia, and it caused Paul's outburst. They had fallen from grace into law. For legalism in Christianity is a different religion, another gospel from that which had been preached to them by Paul, just as different from Christianity as is Mohammedanism or Buddhism. It must be remembered that the Galatians did not have the New Testament. In fact, Paul died before the four gospels were written. Paul never heard the Sermon on the Mount nor did he ever read the great verses that are so familiar to us. I am the good shepherd, and let not your heart be troubled. This was true of all the Christians living in Jerusalem at that time. 
we who live in the latter half of the 20th century have a long history of Bible study behind us. But take the figure 19 from this present year of our Lord, and suddenly you can understand that these people lived in a spiritual age totally different from our own. Come to Jerusalem for a moment and watch the early disciples. What did they do during the week following the resurrection of Christ? You may be sure that on Saturday they went back to the Jewish temple, doing what comes naturally. The veil had been torn in two at the moment our Lord died on the cross, but the priests had sewed it up again and were back in business. The early Christians did not know enough to avoid the place. And what did they do on the days after Pentecost? Again, they went back to doing what comes naturally. They were Jews and they did what they had done from childhood. Although it is true that they began to meet together on the first day of the week, some also continued wrongly to keep the seventh day. When their children were born, they circumcised them, though this religious rite had no more place in the plan of God. As 20, 30, 40 years passed, the church at Jerusalem became just the synagogue with a half and half belief in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. It took a tremendous revolution to bring the church out of the stagnant swamp established in Jerusalem after Pentecost. It took the work of the Holy Spirit through Paul and his epistles, and it took the battle between Peter and Paul, which we shall discuss when we come to the second chapter of Galatians, to break the Christians loose from Judaism. The most terrible part of this lapse into Judaism was that the Christians of Jerusalem wanted to force all professing Christians, even Gentiles, to live as did the Jews. For all practical purposes, they wanted them to become Jews, to accept circumcision, and to look toward Jerusalem as the center of faith. They did not realize that God was through with buildings as a place of residence and that henceforth he would live in the hearts of men. While he was here on earth, the Lord Jesus made provision for the emancipation of his followers from the curse of the law. He announced in Matthew 16, 9, Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. There have been those who have attempted to use this verse as the foundation of their claim to dispose of the souls of men. This will not stand the test of the scriptures. Christ was talking about things, not persons. The disciples understood this and met in Jerusalem for the first church council in order to put his command into effect. In the 15th chapter of the Acts, we have the account of the meeting. It should be noted that Peter was not the chairman of the meeting. That place was held by James, half-brother of Jesus Christ, son of Mary by Joseph. Peter spoke, however, and said, Why do you make trial of God by putting a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? James summed up the arguments thus. Therefore, my sentence is, and the Greek is very strong, I myself pass final judgment, that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the pollutions of idols and from unchastity and from what is strangled. This was followed by letters to the churches which brought the name of God into the decision. Wherefore, it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Thus, what was bound on earth was bound in heaven. This account contains a phrase which perfectly describes what happened in Galatia. We should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. But as soon as Paul had evangelized the region and departed, a committee of Judaizers came on his heels to undo the work of grace which had been begun among them. The volatile, changeable Galatians were thrown off balance. Paul heard about it, 
and came to their rescue with this epistle. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ for another absolutely different gospel, which is not another gospel, not a second gospel, for there is only one true gospel. But there are some men who trouble you and desire to pervert the gospel of Christ. We know what a moral pervert is, and we should realize that anyone who tempers with the true gospel of the sovereign grace of God is a spiritual pervert. At the thought of this perversion, the Holy Spirit once and again pronounces a curse on the false teacher. Christ said that it would be better for such teachers never to have been born, or that it would be better for them to have a millstone put around their neck and be cast into the sea than that they should misteach the Lord's little ones. Even a heavenly angel who thus taught would come under the same curse. Take warning, whoever you may be, who try to mix law with grace and bring the Lord's little ones under bondage to a legalistic system that comes from man instead of teaching the full grace of Christ. He then continues, verse 10, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Paul was the last man to wish to curry favor with men. He had no desire but to please God. And surely if he wanted to please men, it was a strange road to take since becoming a bond slave of Jesus Christ meant crucifying the flesh and turning away from what was naturally pleasing to man. Verse 11, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I did not receive it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through a revelation of Jesus Christ. This brings us to the great question, what is the gospel? It is the good news that God has been reconciled to man and has turned his face toward man through Jesus Christ. It is the good news that man is brought back to God, not by man's character or man's works or man's religion, but by the sovereign grace of God in Christ. Most especially, it is the good news that the yoke of the law has been forever broken by the redemptive work of Christ. Salvation is not by grace plus law, or grace plus works, or grace plus anything else, but by grace alone. This is not man's gospel. It is entirely from God. A human gospel would not have had a crucifixion to scandalize the Jews and incur the ridicule of the Gentiles. Paul reminds them that he had not been taught the gospel by any man, least of all by the eleven disciples. He had met Christ on the road to Damascus, had seen him alive, and knew him in person, and it was from Christ alone that he had learned the gospel. It was this gospel which had come to Paul through revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ himself that the Galatians were deserting in favor of a return to Judaism with a faint Christian perfume. Against this false gospel, Paul cries out in the wrath that came from the Holy Spirit. In the rest of this epistle, he proves without the shadow of a doubt that the gospel of grace alone is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In these verses, Paul now proceeds to make it absolutely clear that the gospel of the grace of God, which he had taught the Galatians, and from which they were falling away back into legalism, was not his own invention. It would have been impossible for Paul, with his background and training and religion, to have invented such a gospel. If we are to understand what happened to Paul on the Damascus Road, we must think of the steps by which he came there. He had been brought up in Tarsus, hundreds of miles from Jerusalem. Most likely he had never even once heard of Jesus Christ. 
when he completed the classical education which his wealthy father had been able to give him, he was sent to Jerusalem to round off his Jewish education. At about that time, the infant church was becoming known. The Pharisees, who had put Christ to death, thinking thus to be rid of him, found themselves faced with a much greater embarrassment. A group of believers who were testifying that Christ was alive from the dead. The Pharisees must have received Saul of Tarsus with open arms. Here was a mind that surpassed any that they had met. Here was a zeal that flamed from a volcanic heart like lava. We can well imagine that when Paul learned that a group of Jews was claiming that it was no longer necessary to go to the temple or to offer sacrifices, his righteous indignation increased to fury. He set out in hot pursuit of these Christians, thinking that he was doing God a favor to rid the earth of them. Paul was acting entirely according to the law of Moses. Judged without the fact of the resurrection of Christ, he was quite right in putting the law into effect and stoning those who attempted to overthrow it. We can understand Paul only if we realize that he was in the covenant of Abraham, as much saved as was Isaiah or John the Baptist. He was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel and of the tribe of Benjamin. Most important, the Holy Spirit allowed him to say in Philippians 3 that touching the righteousness of the law, he was blameless. Thus, he was not only in covenant relationship with God, but he followed through all of the ceremonies prescribed by God for his people. And then, the experience of the Damascus Road. This cannot be counted as his new birth, I believe. That had taken place long before. Of this he is positive, as he also tells Timothy. He describes that experience now. Verse 15, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Here is the outline of Paul's experience. His salvation began with God. It was by God's sovereign grace and good pleasure. God separated Paul from his mother's womb and on the Damascus road revealed Christ to him. Then Paul was immediately transferred out of his relationship to God under the old covenant into his new relationship with God in the church under the new covenant. Verse 16, Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them that were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. When one knows that he has met Christ and that Christ has revealed himself, it is not necessary to go to men for teaching. The Holy Spirit will reveal truth in line with the Word of God in such a way that there is objective certainty and subjective assurance. Outside is the rock, Christ Jesus, and inside is new life, which is also Christ Jesus. Here is the basis of all true knowledge. After Paul had seen the Lord, he did not go to Jerusalem and take a course under Peter in the life and teachings of Jesus. He went into Arabia, and there the Lord taught him. We cannot know what happened between Paul and the Lord in Arabia. There is no word about this in the Bible. It is like Paul's other experience when he was caught up into heaven and heard things that were not lawful for a man to utter. We do know that at some time between Christ's making himself known to Paul and his return to Jerusalem 17 years after, God had made known to him all of the great truths of the gospel that we find in his epistles. May God bless to us each verse as we read it. We read in Galatians chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. But other of the apostles I saw none, save James, the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God, I lie not. 
Paul is very emphatic because he wants to establish in the minds of his readers that he did not receive his doctrines from any man. He had not sat at the feet of some other disciple and absorbed his teaching. He had been taught by God and by God alone. The origin of Paul's religion is the Holy Spirit rooting his doctrines in the teachings of the Lord Jesus and in the Old Testament. He did not originate anything, but he was the channel of divine revelation. When Paul visited Jerusalem the first time, he saw only two of the leading brethren, Peter and James, the Lord's brother. This James was the son of Mary by Joseph. The Lord Jesus had half-brothers and half-sisters. The Bible flatly contradicts any idea that Mary was a perpetual virgin. One of the great prophecies of the Old Testament spells this out with great clarity. In Psalm 69, 8 and 9, we read, I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children, for the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Mary was a good and faithful wife to Joseph and bore him a large family of children. In the Gospels, there are the names of four of Jesus' brothers and it speaks of his sisters in the plural, so we know that there were at least two. Thus we know that the Virgin Mary became the wife Mary and that she bore Joseph at least six children. In the Gospel of John, we read that the brothers had not yet believed on Jesus, but now by the time of Paul, they have believed, and James is the chairman of the group of the apostles in Jerusalem. Now, in regard to all that Paul says about these matters, he calls God to witness that he is telling the truth. He says, before God, I lie not. Now, verse 21. Afterwards, I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed, and they glorified God in me. Paul the unknown. It's a startling phrase. Many people may imagine that Paul was reached on the Damascus road and that he began preaching immediately and writing epistles within a few days. As a matter of fact, the process was a slow one. God called him. God revealed Christ to him, and then God taught him. God does not use mushrooms in his work. He uses oak trees. You can grow a mushroom in a night, but it takes years to make an oak. Paul was seasoned in the desert of Arabia, and then for 14 years, he worked in the back country of Syria and Cilicia. There were no special mass meetings with headlines, persecutor turns preacher, come and hear farmer killer tell his story. There was never any publicizing of the gory details of his persecution of Christians. Whenever he mentions his former life, it is with tears because he had persecuted Christ. All that the Jerusalem believers knew about him for the 17 years of his seasoning was that he was somewhere out in the Gentile country. What a lesson is here for young preachers. What a revelation of the ways of God. A person who has come into the gospel recently should never be advanced to a place of prominence. Although a man may be a seasoned Christian when he is even young in years, as Paul told Timothy that no one was to despise his youth, Paul's experience should be a great example to the church. Publicizing past sin may bring crowds and may bring glory to the preacher, but it will never bring glory to God. Down in Jerusalem, the memory of the persecutions soon died out. The rumor went around that the old persecutor was now preaching the gospel. It was all far away and long ago. I seem to detect a note of condescension in the voice of the leaders. They uh, glorified God in me. Now chapter 2, verse 1. Then, 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, 
lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. The first great doctrinal struggle in the history of Christianity was about to begin. The whole of the form and ceremony of the Old Testament had, because of the death of Jesus Christ, ceased to be divine commandments and had become nothing more than the Jews' religion. God's time had now come for Paul to take the place of leadership that the truth of divine grace might be established. Paul did not run ahead of God. His natural bent would have been to go to Jerusalem and confound lesser minds with his knowledge and truth. But he waited on God. I did not plan this myself, says Paul. It was God himself who brought me to Jerusalem. When God thrusts a man forward, there will be certain blessing. When man runs ahead of God, there can be only failure and a blot on God's honor before the world. Paul did not go to Jerusalem to learn from Peter or any of the other disciples. He did not go to learn, but to teach. He was not afraid that he himself had been mistaken, but he was afraid that even Peter and the elders of the church in Jerusalem had slipped backwards into Judaism and that they would refuse the doctrine of the full grace of God. If they did such a thing, they would be blocking the divine plan to establish the true church on the doctrine of grace alone. It's interesting to note that the Jews throughout modern history have maintained their errors by thinking that their religion centered in Moses while in reality it centers in Abraham. Another great segment of Christendom has fallen into a similar error. They have founded their church on Peter instead of on the truths that were preached through Paul. Note also that arriving in Jerusalem, Paul went directly to the leaders of the church. At times there are evangelists who go into a town without consulting with the ministerial association. And then, when they are not backed up the way they think they should be, they hurl epithets at true believers, saying that these are not following the will of the Lord. But Paul did not go to Jerusalem to start preaching without first stopping by the offices of the ministerial association. Paul was not a separatist. He had a deep love in his heart for these men. And this journey to Jerusalem was for the express purpose of making it possible for him to work with these men. If you like, you may say that Paul wanted to work under the auspices of the organized church. Verse 3, But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. There was no compromise on Paul's part as to the matter of ritual and its place. Titus, an uncircumcised Gentile, was now a believer and was Paul's helper. The crux of the problem was centered in this young, uncircumcised Greek Christian. Would he be segregated or integrated? Paul would never give ground on a matter like this. Fellowship among believers had to be on the basis of fellowship with the Lord. If a man is saved, we must fellowship with him, no matter what the differences on matters of ritual. Paul would never have tolerated closed communion for a moment. To have forced circumcision upon Titus would be the same as to force a particular form of communion or a particular mode of baptism upon a true child of God. How Paul cries out in triumph over this victory. The men who had come to Galatia preaching false doctrines had claimed authority from Jerusalem. And now, Jerusalem decides for the truth, and the leaders are obedient to the Holy Spirit. There were no rules drawn up as conditions for church membership. The young, uncircumcised Greek was accepted on the basis of salvation by grace alone. Verse 4, And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. These spies who had slipped into the meeting of the leaders were not true believers in Christ. They were not ignorant Christians or untaught Christians or even Christians who had gone off on some tangent of error. 
They were men who wanted to make salvation contingent upon the keeping of their set of rules. They were under the curse which had been pronounced by the Holy Spirit, as we have seen in chapter 1, verse 9. They were preaching another gospel which was not the true gospel at all. As in that day, so in this. There are those who want but one thing. They want everyone to agree with their pet doctrines and their favorite rules. The Holy Spirit can never use a man who is trying to maintain his own system of doctrine, for God can never permit a man to intervene in a work that belongs to God alone. Once more, Paul cries out in triumph, We did not give place to these men for a moment. We were not outvoted. We maintained our cause with the true brethren in spite of the false brethren. This was so that the truth of the gospel might remain with you with us even down to the 20th century. Now, what was the truth of the gospel that Paul was maintaining? The virgin birth? No. The blood atonement? No. The inspiration of the scriptures? No. Both Paul and his opponents believed all these things. There was no controversy in these areas. The truth of the gospel was that the Christian life is the life of the heart. No man can be saved and no saved man can be made holy through any keeping of the law or any observance of a list of don'ts. The Christian life is the possession of the whole being by the Holy Spirit. It means that we are to be dominated by him, that we are to be brought to holiness of life by his life in us. The failure of these men to realize this great fact was sufficient for Paul to call them false brethren and to oppose them with all the intellectual and spiritual powers that God had given him. Verse 6. But of these who seemed to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. For they who seemed to be somewhat, in conference, added nothing to me. The men referred to here were not the false brethren of verse 4, but the true leaders, the really big men of the Jerusalem church. They seemed to be somewhat. It's humorous, perhaps, that in English the initials are SS, for such a pair of initials today might be DD. Do not be mistaken. Education and honors are often used by God, but it is not by man's mind that the souls of men can be reached but only through the Holy Spirit. If we ask what men in the Bible were most used by God, we might well say that these were Moses in the Old Testament and Paul in the New. Secondly, if we ask which men had the greatest education, the answer would be the same, Moses and Paul. And we would even discover that in both cases, the education was a pagan education. Moses in Pharaoh's court, and Paul in the Greek philosophy of Tarsus, and a year of graduate work with a Christ rejecting Gamaliel. But Paul had been willing to become nothing, while the leaders of the Jerusalem church seemed to be somewhat. They had nothing to add to what the Lord had given Paul. On all matters pertaining to doctrine, the apostles had nothing to add to that which had been taught to Paul by the Holy Spirit in the desert. None of the disciples had mind, intellect, or zeal to equal Paul's. But it was not for this reason that they did not modify his doctrine in any point. The reason for the finality of Paul's point of view was revealed back in the first chapter. My gospel is not according to man. The leaders in Jerusalem felt this and thus kept their hands off God's work and God's glory. Verse 7. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. The Jerusalem disciples and Paul both saw clearly that the gospel was one and the same for all, Jew and Gentile alike but they realized that the Holy Spirit had given to them the work of ministering to the Jews 
and that Paul had been called to minister to the Gentiles. The gospel was the same. There never has been any other gospel. Adam was saved in the same way that we are saved today, by believing God's word about the Savior and the shedding of his blood. There could be no greater error than to say that God had ever changed his method of justifying sinners. Verse 9, And when James, Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. The 15th of Acts gives the story behind this verse. James was the presiding officer in the church council. Peter and John were leading brethren. They seemed to be somewhat, and now they seemed to be pillars. Places of human leadership mean nothing. Peter was no vicar of Christ. These men saw the truth of the gospel as it was now stated by Paul and went along with him in his teaching. If they had done this earlier, there would have been no place for the Judaizers. We read in the Acts that Peter said, God put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. From then on, it was merely a question of shaking hands and congratulating Paul on his missionary statesmanship. Verse 10. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. There's almost a humorous note under this verse. Paul was visiting headquarters. He had just brought a glowing report of God's work among the Gentiles. We don't know who was in charge of the central treasury, but they asked Paul to see to it that the offerings should continue to be made to headquarters. Paul did not reply that all their money was to be designated for spiritual uses only. He understood the necessity for what might be called social service. Whenever the Holy Spirit is in control, there will be a balance between correct doctrine and correct living. Everything is dependent on grace alone, working in the heart through the Holy Spirit. It would appear that after the meeting, Paul asked Peter if he would like to travel a bit and see the gospel at work in the Gentile world. A missionary journey may transform the life of a true Christian. Peter decided to go. What follows will be all the more startling if we remember an incident in the earlier life of Peter. God had appeared to him and told him to go to the house of Cornelius, a Gentile. Peter had argued stubbornly with God about the whole matter. The Gentile messengers from Cornelius had found Peter in the house of Simon the Tanner. Peter invited these Gentiles in to spend the night. Now there's nothing written in the Bible about the reaction of the Jewish host to this sudden manifestation of Peter's desegregation attitude. But it must not be forgotten that a Jewish tanner, whose shop smelled as tanneries always do, would have considered his house more defiled by the presence of these Roman soldiers than he would by the stench from his tanning vats. Here, Peter was acting as a believer should act, obeying God and giving no thought to the possible offense to his host. But now, in Antioch, years later, we see another side of Peter. He had defended Gentile rights at the Council of Jerusalem. He had struck hands with Paul and given his approval to Paul's mission to the Gentiles. He was absolutely convinced of the doctrinal correction of Paul's stand. But now watch him. I'm going to tell the story before I read the verses, because at times we're so accustomed to the smooth cadences of the Bible that we fail to see what is really being said. Peter arrived with Paul in the home of Gentiles. He sat there in the room, looking around on Gentile ways. He smelled the food cooking, and soon saw, let us say, a roast of pork put on the table. He took his first taste of pork. Not bad. Little by little, he let his prejudices be put down, and he began to live day after day in all the liberty of a Gentile household. 
he was eating what was set before him and asking no questions for conscience sake. Then there came a knock at the door. It was a committee from Jerusalem to investigate conditions among the Gentile Christians. Peter left by the back door through the alley. He stopped at the drugstore to get something like chlorophyll to take the odor of pork from his breath. And he returned by the front door to meet the committee. Oh, it's so nice for us Jews to greet you. We are glad to see you. It was then that Paul broke out and said, Peter, I'm not going to let you get away with it. And now after I've told you this story, let us read it as it is in the scriptures. And we will see that what I have set forth is the true picture. Verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, again note that Peter, the supposed pope, was afraid of a committee from James. He did eat pork, let us say, with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them that were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him. That's the chlorophyll. Dissembled. Insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. It is not a pretty picture. Peter was acting like an abject coward afraid of the disciples who were his denominational superiors. But even more, he was compromising the truth of the gospel. If there had been no more than a compromise about eating, Paul would not have said anything. There are fields in which Christians may differ, and the 14th of Romans shows us that the matter of diet is one of them. But this was something different, without question. Peter did not fully understand the implication of the thing he did. But Paul, enlightened by the Holy Spirit, saw that this was not merely an exhibition of Jewish snobbishness or an uncouth fisherman's lack of courtesy. This was the rejection of the gospel of grace. As a matter of fact, this incident is the stone which the rationalists of the last century, and especially Bauer in Germany, used as a foundation for their theory that Paul's teaching was in conflict with Peter's and therefore different from Christ's and that the whole gospel of Greece is a colossal fabrication. Now before we consider the tremendous dressing down which Peter received from Paul, let us remind ourselves that Peter later acknowledged that he was wrong and that Paul was right. In Peter's second epistle, he wrote, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Oh, thank you, Peter. It takes a great man to say, I was wrong, dead wrong. Paul was right. He says some things that are over my head, but his wisdom comes from God, and he is right. May God bless to us this reading from his word.